It's hot. You can be seated. Wow, it's so good to be here. Feels like being back with family. Um, but good night. I do not miss these summers. We lived in the Metroplex for a few years. And um, I mean, talk about prayer life. Your prayer life really starts to be tested in these seasons. We actually, I'm here with my daughter, Katura. She's on the front row. She's almost a teenager. And uh, she's here with me on a daddy-daughter little trip. And uh, anyway, yesterday we landed and somebody gave us tickets to the uh, baseball game at Ranger Stadium. And it just so happened to be a SoCal team playing them. We brought a little bit of the SoCal anointing, I think, because the Dodgers, yeah, it was ugly. 16 to 3. Um, the Dodgers crushed them. But here's the thing. Texas has heard from heaven because they created a baseball dome with air conditioning. There was a revelation from heaven that was released. And anyway, I'll take that anointing to other cities. Um, it's so good to be with you here. I want to acknowledge, I mean, there's so many friends and family uh, of us here, but, but I want to acknowledge um, uh, Jamie and Whitney. They're standing here somewhere. They're, they came all the way from Reading and they're visiting today. Where are they? Come on, stand up. Right here, stand up, greet the people. So Jamie uh, produces all, all of my music, plays guitar with me. We've, uh, <laughs> we've uh, fought Antifa together in the spirit and in the natural. Um, Whitney was my assistant for a really, really long time and really helped make Let Us Worship work. And so anyway, we're so grateful they're here. And listen, I'm sending y'all some good people, okay? And I know it's just going to come back on me. Praise Jesus. Um, but hey, listen, I, want, I got a, a, a cool little video I want to share with you. This is something really special uh, that we made just for you guys. So roll it. In a time when all was lost, when the country was divided, you, Mercy Culture, stood by our side. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't express enough how grateful we are, my family, our ministry, for your support. Man, you guys had my back when so many other people didn't. When so many other people thought we were crazy, you guys, maybe some of you still thought we were crazy, but you got behind us, you loved us, you supported us, and I just wanna thank you. I wanna thank Pastor Landon and Heather and Pastor Jasmine and all of you guys. Can we just give a hand for this church? I wanna say this, you are on the right side of history. Can someone say amen? amen. You're on the right side of history and so I just, I wanna honor, honor you guys and I wanna pray that this would be a season where when you stood up for what was right in the pandemic, in the darkness, in the lockdowns, when you rose up and became a voice of truth and hope for America, I pray that God is gonna release such a favor and an anointing that you can't even handle it, amen? And um, I want to talk today a little bit about, I want to talk about prayer. First, throw this up there, the text Sean slide. We're getting canceled and censored all the time. So some of you guys might not know we're on the middle of this Kingdom to the Capital Tour where we're bringing worship to all 50 U.S. capitals. It's a very ambitious journey. These are all the capitals we've visited so far. I got them on here. And uh, we're headed up to... Uh, Olympia, Washington on Friday. Okay, this is going to be the most gnarly, knockdown, drag out capital. The whole satanic temple has mobilized their people. So we're gonna have a good old fashioned Mount Carmel, Elijah moment this Friday. So I want you guys to, to sign up to this. Listen, this is just so you can stay in touch and pray for us. 
I am here to challenge you today. I have a word in my heart, but I want you to join us and pray for us. So sign up here. If you, if you text Sean to 2022 one, it'll put you on our prayer list and we'll be able to stay connected. Um, we're so excited. How many were with us in, the, in, in Austin, in the state capitol there? Man, that was such a powerful time. I'm gonna share a little bit of that in my message today. So here's what I'm calling this. Live up to your name. Turn to someone, say, live up to your name. This is my challenge to you, Mercy Culture, but my challenge to the Church of America today. It's time for us to live up to our name. John Wesley, you know, the famous, you know, one of the leaders in the first and second great awakenings, we were just up in New England, and uh, it's incredible what God is doing. I mean, I love going to places people think are impossible. I love going to dark cities. I love, some people, like they, they like to, you know, flee to easy places. I have this mandate to go into places where no one thinks it's possible. Of course, we've gone into North Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, Saudi Arabia. God sent us into a lot of crazy countries. But I have this mandate, so we were in New England, a place that people think is a church graveyard. We were just there this last weekend. But yet these, this is the birthplace of the great awakenings in America. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Brown University, these were Bible schools, seminaries, right, that trained ministers. And uh, so anyway, we were up there and I was just reminded of this John Wesley quote that says this, God does nothing in, except in response to believing prayer. God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. And I think about the place of prayer and I think about the days when I was, an early, was a worship leader growing up in a charismatic culture and, and growing up, uh, I mean, I lo always loved worship, never pictured myself as a worship leader, I ne didn't have any musicians in my family, I mean, didn't grow up learning music, but I just loved the presence of God and that's what caught, caused me to wanna learn guitar because I was like, hey, I could take this thing and do it in my bedroom. And so I got a guitar and I learned, I learned two chords, which, I mean, the day that I learned three, it was just like, I can play every worship song ever. I know four today, so I can do a little bit more. But I remember thinking to myself, okay, the more anguish and pain on the face of the worship leader, the more breakthrough we're having. <laughs> Come on, guys, charismatic culture, right? The more constipated the intercessor looks, the more we're rending the heavens. I was like, that's what I need to do. I need to look like I'm in pain. <laughs> but then God started showing me a, a different dimension of prayer. And it, it really hit me, I'm gonna be honest, it hit me the biggest in my life the moment I stepped on the tarmac in Pyongyang, North Korea. Katura, who's on the front row, was a three-month-old baby. I had been praying for 15 years. God, if I could get the opportunity to go in North Korea, I, I had a hit list of the, the top five most unreached nations. North Korea was number one. I didn't know anybody that ever went in there and worshiped. Long story short, I, I can't go into the whole story, but it was a miracle how I got an opportunity to go. And, you know, they didn't stamp my passport. Of course, you know, America, I mean, the number one nation they strongly recommend you don't go to is North Korea. There's no diplomatic relations. But I remember psyching myself up. We were in Beijing, China, and we were taking, the, uh, taking one plane. There's one plane a week into Pyongyang. We were in Beijing, China, getting ready to get on that one plane into Pyongyang, North Korea. And I remember psyching myself up. I gotta get intense. I'm gonna give my life for the gospel. I could get detained, which is all very true. The moment I got off the plane in Pyongyang, North Korea, my foot hit the ground and this statement from Billy Graham came to my mind because his wife went to Bible school in Pyongyang, North Korea. And there was such a glory in that city at one time, they once called it the Jerusalem of the East. And my foot hit the ground and I started uncontrollably laughing. Guys, I'm not joking, like I'm for real. 
I'm in North Korea. I've never met anybody that went in North Korea. I'm like in the most hostile nation as, as an American and I cannot stop laughing. It's uncontrollable laughter. And the entire time that I was there, I was there for like 10 days, no communication with my wife or anybody and my baby, my first baby, this three month old, people thought I was crazy. But I had waited my whole life for this moment. The entire trip was one Holy Ghost joy bomb. I mean, we had guards assigned to us. Like if I wanted to go to the bathroom, the guard was right next to me. Talk about awkward. They followed us everywhere, just intimidation tactics. And I just, the whole time I'm smiling at them, high-fiving them. I'm like, what's up, guys? They're calling us the infidel. They're trying to tell us all this kind of stuff. And I am smiling through every force of darkness that came against me. And the Lord began to teach me about a different way of intercession. Come on, this is for mercy culture a place of intercession that's actually sustainable. Because you can do this for a minute with the furrow in your head. You can do that for a little bit and then you're kind of like, whoa. <laughs> I'll tell you what you can do a lot, this. You can do this all day, baby. He who sits in the heavens laughs. And if we are gonna sustain the kind of prayer that God wants to put on this house, we're gonna do it from the posture of joy. Sustainable. So if you look in Luke chapter 11, you find uh, Jesus, uh, he's with his disciples. His disciples have a demand for him. They, 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 there's one thing that they continue to ask him again and again and again. And surprisingly, it's not how to grow a church. Surprisingly, it's not how to build a social media following. Surprisingly, it's not how to get more money or more prosperity or to get, surprisingly, it's not a lot of the things like that we focus on in church or in our discipleship or leadership classes. Surprisingly, the thing that they're asking and demanding of Jesus again and again and again is this. Lord, teach us how to pray. This is the number one request for the disciples. Teach us how to pray because they recognized that the source of his authority came from the depth of his intimacy. They recognized that Jesus was not even attached to his own popularity. One of my favorite things, you know, it's like revival's breaking out, people are freaking out, and it's like, oh, you know, everything's going crazy, and it's like the power of God and all this kind of stuff, and it's like, where's Jesus? He's like gone. He just ghosted everybody. At the height of revival, Jesus says, oh, there he is. He's walking on the hillside again. He's going to pray again. Come on, Jesus, you're supposed to steward this thing. Jesus is like, I'm out, peace. He was so connected to his father in the place of prayer. And I feel like, guys, there's a lot of angles I could take with this today, but I feel like if we correct this in our lives, we'll be a whole lot less depressed, anxious, worried. Like, for some reason, we feel like, and I find this whether it's online or whether it's in our lives or whether in our culture, like we're responsible to one person at the end of the day for our life. Not the masses, not the trolls. One person, and that's the person that we must be connected to in the place of prayer, in the place of intimacy. So the disciples knew that, and of course, Luke chapter 11, you can throw that up. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. He told them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be in your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, and we also forgive everyone else who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. So he begins to teach them. Pray your kingdom come. Pray this, my disciples, that this place would look like that place. Now this tour that we're on with all these states on my back, <laughs> I, I, feel like, I feel like we got tricked into this thing, man. It was like, I, I'm just being... Uh, this is a vulnerable Sean at Mercy Culture moment, but we, you know, we, we, we fought 
for two years, three years, you know, we, we rose up in California, the most restricted state in America. We rose up in New York. I became the number one COVID violator in 29 states. I have more lawsuits against me and fines against me than you could ever, ever imagine. More haters against me. I have been doxxed 12 times. You know what doxing means? All your private information? Everything. My family, my addresses, my everything. I mean, I have, we have been so attacked. And so, and so I'm kind of thinking, man, Lord, like, you know, you know you're going to lead us maybe into like a, a, I'm feeling like a sabbatical season. <laughs> you know, like, a, you know, like green pastures and. And then the Lord gives us this mandates for the capitals, which just so you guys are aware, the state capitals in America are the most ghetto, crime infested, God forsaken, overregulated, resistant to the gospel cities in America. They are a failed experiment of how government destroyed everything. Capital cities. Yeah, Sean, go to the capital cities. So we've gone to 21 capitals so far. We face the most insane stuff you can imagine, right? I mean, uh, not only just, you know, governors and legislators. Yeah, you can have drag queen story hour, but you're going to, the church wants to worship? Uh-oh. <laughs> so we've had this in every state, state by state by state. But I feel like we got tricked into this, this situation here where it's, it's, it's been far more of a, of a battle because what we're bringing to these legislative centers is such a thing that they fear. Like this is why the Satanists, they didn't really mess with us until we started going to the capitals. They're like, well, hold on a sec. He's going to our territory. Come on. <laughs> I mean, are you feeling this? Like, if you have the satanic temple of the world starting a mock tour, they took our, our cross right here, turned it upside down, and they called the tour, Let Us Burn. And they're raising money to, to copy our tour going to the capitals. And this is what they said, direct quote from the satanic temple leader. He said this, we wanna make sure we're gonna go to every state capital before Sean gets there so we can remind him that this is the devil's ground. This is what they're saying. I said, bro, you ain't, you ain't read the Bible. <laughs> Bible says the earth is the Lord's. You get zero real estate. The enemy gets zero real estate. Nothing. He gets no, no section, no state, no city, no corner of America. And so the enemy has been so threatened because how dare we come and worship in these capital cities? How dare we turn the altars, right, that have been given over to abortion and sexu sexualizing our children and all of these agendas, how dare we turn those over into an altar? How dare we become like David and say, you know what? I don't want to rule in this state unless the ark of his presence is set rightly. And man, it's made some demons mad. We've had warfare. I mean, we had a drunk driver crash into our bus. Someone stole my guitar. We have, I mean, it's been nonstop warfare in this season. But I'm telling y'all something. I'm actually really happy. <laughs> because we're watching God demolish Satan in every city and we're just smiling. We're like, this is awesome. I was in New York City, Times Square, New York City, and, and it's always the craziest people you can imagine that show up there. A guy in Times Square, New York City is randomly on the streets, comes by, throws a paper down in the middle of our thing. I'm like, what is this paper? I didn't even pick it up because we were worshiping. There's thousands of people there. He writes in later, he says, my whole life I've been battling cross-dressing, I've been battling homosexuality. I've been battling pornography. And he's like, God told me if I wrote this on a piece of paper and I threw it in the middle of worship, that something would break off my life. And he's like, I'm telling you today, I'm living in freedom. <laughs> Times Square, New York City. 
I had a girl come up to me this, in Richmond, Virginia. This is a few weeks ago. She came up to me. She said, Sean, I want to tell you something. I said, what? What's up? She goes, listen. She's like, I came to the last Let Us Worship here last year. She said, the day after Let Us Worship, I had it scheduled to transition. She's like, I, I was gonna transition my gender. And she said, but my mom told me, I'm not gonna take you to that appointment unless you go to Let Us Worship the night before. That's a gangster mom. She shows up at Let Us Worship. She said, there were 7,000 people there. I didn't even know what was happening. I didn't want to be there. But the moment the worship started and you started preaching about hope and identity, she said, next thing I knew, I found myself at the altar and I found myself weeping. And she said, I wept to the Lord. She's like, that day, everything broke off of my life. She said, I grew my hair out. And she looked at me, she's like, guess what? I have a boyfriend that I think I'm gonna marry. I said, I'm coming to your wedding. <laughs> Guys, this is happening all over America. Can I just give you one praise break? L look at this. I tweeted this earlier. This is some good news on Twitter. Listen, this is fire. The Sound of Freedom is over 100 million in the box office, defying all expectations. Disney, Disney has lost 900 million on their last eight releases. Let's go. Target and Bud Light have lost billions over boycotts. This is a season of defying. God is moving. God is moving and it's time for us today to get in the game. It's time for us to live up to our name. So in Matthew 16, there's this moment, and I know you guys understand this verse, but hopefully I wanna bring a new context to it. Matthew 16, live up to your name. Dallas, mega church central. We got the coolest mega churches, biggest buildings. We got, you know, entire restaurants that cater to the after church crowd. We gotta schedule our services so we don't miss the cowboys. You know, it's just like this culture, you can so easily fit into this culture. Now y'all, I'm preaching the choir a little bit because y'all are crazy. But I, I just wanna encourage you again what an anomaly you are because we fit into this culture of church and niceness and like I live in California, you don't go to church unless you like are like one million percent saved. Okay, and, and that's part of what makes us gangsters. No, seriously, I, I could brag on my state that I live in that I hated for a long time that God showed me to love. Because in COVID, even people in Texas were scared. In California, we were raging. In the bluest states, in the darkest cities, sometimes that's where the revival is. They're the ones that are the hungriest. I'm telling you, when we go up to Olympia, Washington this weekend, Salem, Oregon, Boise, Idaho, they will be the wildest lettuce worships we have all year. Where all the witchcraft and all the demonic, God is raising up a fearless church. But in Matthew 16, we have this moment where Jesus, you know, he's, he decides to, to, you know, he's not just gonna teach them. And of, of course, in Galilee, it's beautiful. And the Galilee, you know, he's always teaching them in nature and, and everything. But he decides this time, I, I'm, gonna teach, I'm gonna tell them something so important that they need to have like an object lesson behind us. They need to be looking at what I'm talking about. So he brings them up to Caesarea Philippi in the north of Israel, which is quite a, quite a journey from Galilee. And they're up in Caesarea Philippi and they're standing in a literal demonic stronghold. They're standing on, on like a, a, a place of perversion and witchcraft and, and, and sorcery and abortion and child sacrifice. They're standing at like the darkest place in the region. And the disciples must have been wondering, like, what the heck are we doing up here? Like, this is gnarly. This pagan, pagan site in, Ma in, in Matthew 16, if you'll turn there with me, Jesus begins to bring the clearest definition of the church in the darkest region. 
pay attention here. He gives the clearest definition of the calling of the church as they're standing in front of the darkest principality. And so, you know this, this story in Matthew 16, Jesus came to reason Caesarea Philippi, verse 13, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they start echoing what the masses are saying. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets, no, 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 you know. They say this on Twitter, they say this on Facebook, I mean, the media says this, I mean, what, 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 do, we, what do you mean? And Jesus goes, I don't give a rip about what those people think. Guys, in the church of Jesus Christ, we got to stop caring about what the world thinks about God. Of course the media is gonna hate Jesus, of course, like listen to this. All of these institutions and culture, they've all been hijacked. And I mean, we're seeing it in our day unlike ever before. Education has been hijacked by psychopaths wanting to pervert our children and their innocence, right? See, uh, the, the business arena has been, hoaked, been, been, been hijacked by woke CEOs that are pushing garbage, you know, and, and pushing these agendas and the, pushing this stuff. And thankfully, America's pushing back against it. Hollywood has been hijacked for a long time. Politics has been hijacked. There was cocaine in the White House. Hello? I mean, let's just be honest here. Like, all of these institutions are hijacked. You know the one institution that will never, ever, ever be hijacked? the church of Jesus Christ. For the first time in 2,000 years, listen to this, for the first time in 2,000 year history of the church, there was a global agenda to shut the church down. Never before in the history of the church has there been a harsh, global agenda, not just in one country, every country. And we live through that. Can you believe that? We live through that nonsense and we see it now for what it is. So Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? That's what I care about. And of course, you know, Peter says, um, um, uh, you're the Messiah. And all of heaven's oh, praise God. Took him a while to get that one. And then Jesus says to him, based upon your profession of who I am, I now reveal to you who you are. You can never find out who you are unless you find out who he is first. All this soul searching, therapy, all that. I don't, therapy, all that stuff's good. But I'm telling you, one moment with an encounter with him, he'll reveal who you are. So he reveals, he says, awesome, you finally got it right. Now I'm gonna tell you who you are. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. Dun, 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 dun. And on this rock, I will build my entertainment center. On this rock, I will build my Dallas mega church with 14 wings and endless programs to meet every need. On this rock, I will build my cultural compound with no crosses anywhere. It's, it's kind of weird. Like there's a whole generation of kids that grow up going to a church without a cross. Do you realize that? Like crosses are, are we don't, I don't know. There's pa entire pastor dialogues that are like, I don't know if we should put a cross up, but it's kind of, it's kind of intense. It's kind of, Controversial, duh. No, it says on this rock, and here Jesus gets political, don't blame me, it's Jesus. On this rock, I will build my ecclesia. He doesn't use the word church, he doesn't use the word gathering, he doesn't use the word nice Texas people that smile. No, he says on this rock, I will build my ecclesia. What is the ecclesia? I'm glad you asked. It says, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, ecclesia is this, a political assembly of citizens of ancient Greek states. Jesus used a political term to first ever describe what the church is. Uh-oh. He was referencing 
a group of people that has authority. He was referencing a group of people that legislate. He was, rep re he, was, he was referencing a group of people that when they show up, things happen. I will build my ecclesia, the called out ones. Turn to someone and say, the called out ones. And then he says this, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Throw that picture up from Caesarea Philippi. This is Caesarea Philippi. Jesus was standing in front of this exact place. And that cave is darkness. That cave is an abomination. That cave is witchcraft. That cave is abortion. That cave is, is the most vile things you can imagine. And Jesus is standing there as they're looking at darkness. And he says, you are a big deal. And that force of hell will not stand against you. This is what I feel like when we go to every capital. We stand on the Capitol steps and we say, I don't give a rip what's happening in this building. The gates of hell will not prevail against Connecticut. The gates of hell will not prevail against Vermont. The gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus is showing them that they're kind of a big deal. It's time to live up to your name. Then he says this, and I'm gonna give you action items. I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So he defines who they're called to be and then he tells them how they're gonna activate it. This is not gonna prevail. You know why? Because you got authority, baby. When you pray, things change. You got the keys to the kingdom. You got the keys to set people free. You got the keys to bind and loose. You got the keys to legislate. You got the keys. I remember when we were there in the Texas State Capitol, such a cool moment. We were, we were just, we, I don't even know if we asked permission. A lot of times we just ask for forgiveness later, but we, we all went into the Texas State Capitol and we filled that Capitol with praise. Like we, we rushed in and we had some of your amazing legislators and, and people and we put them all in the middle and we said, these bills that are, that are up right now, that are stalled, that are for, supposed to protect children, these bills that are, gonna, that, that, that are going to stop the mutilization of our children, these bills that are gonna stop drag queens happening in schools, these bills will come to pass. And we laid hands on them and we prophesied, no more delay, no more delay. No more delay. No more delay. And you know what? Two weeks later, they all passed. Come on. Come on. That's the ecclesia. That's the ecclesia. That's the ruling body government. That's why this is a big deal. We're not doing this for views and clicks and likes. We're legislating heaven to the earth. This is why we gotta break off the passivity. We gotta break up, and I just feel like, one of the things I feel like God's gonna do today is he's gonna break off the discouragement of the past because it hasn't worked out the way you hoped. And so you stop believing in the way that you pray. Turn to Isaiah 54. So Isaiah 54, and I got a testimony for you, and then we're gonna ignite something powerful. So Isaiah 54. Our prayers are prophetic to pull in the unseen realm. Don't be the so-called prophets of 2023 that are like, it's very dark and difficult and hard. It's gonna get harder and the economy is gonna crash. And I'm like, yeah, that's not prophetic. Like, that's what everyone else is saying, bro. You wanna be prophetic? Speak about something that has not yet happened. Prophesy about a realm that doesn't exist and pull it into reality. So Isaiah 54, it says this. Sing, O barren woman. I mean, even just that title, come on, I heard that, mm -mm, come on. Even that is like a message. Are you barren? Okay, 
sing. You discouraged? Okay, sing. You heart sick? Okay, sing. You bummed? Okay, sing. You know what our culture tells you? Work it out in your soul. It's okay, just feel what you feel. Like, feel it, just sit in your feelings. No, don't sit in your feelings, sing! Pull in another dimension! Well, that's not being real, that's not being authentic. Actually, it's being the most authentic. You don't live according to your feelings. A whole generation needs to break out the addiction they have to their feelings. Don't trust your feelings. Look at me. <laughs> Gen Zers, millennials, don't trust your feelings. They're liars. And I'm a, I'm a musician, man. I'm a feeler. But you can't trust them. They're full of it. Sing, O oh barren woman. Then it gets crazier. You want to hit the joy part? Sing, O oh barren woman. Burst into song. Shout for joy, you who are never in labor. Are you kidding me? The audacity that you're not going to come into agreement with my pain? That's just the problem with the church is they just never let us sit in our pain. Duh. That's because we live from another dimension. I remember one time we were, I, I had this season where God was just freeing people from infertility. It was just wild. And I think it was just because we were actually battling that ourselves in that season, me and my wife. And I remember going to a place and some, some women came down to, to, to get, you know, just to get healing. And they were just broken. I mean, it's just a devastating thing to walk through. And I looked at one of them and I said, you have a baby crib in your closet. I'm not usually like this crazy prophetic. Sometimes I'll like go into these like <laughs> moments. And then I'm always like, dear God, I hope that's true. <laughs> That's, that's just being real. But I said, you have a baby crib in your closet and you have felt so discouraged and so shameful. You ordered it a long time ago and it's just sat there collecting dust and you haven't done anything with it. And the Lord says, today, your prophetic act is to build the crib. I said, it doesn't matter how painful it, are, it is, God is gonna move. Pray, sing, and build the crib. And you know what? They went home, they built the crib, they created their baby room, and a week later, bam, she got pregnant. <laughs> Something happens. Right, when we activate the prophetic prayer, something happens and I wanna share this story. So anyway, so it says this real quick and then I wanna share a story. It says, burst into song, shout for joy. It means like even when you're in a season of pain and difficulty, you don't always have to show it. It's so painful and difficult. No, no, actually it's walking in the opposite spirit is really prophetic. Like man, things really suck right now but God's on the throne. That's not fake, man. That's living from that reality to this one. Burst into song, shout for joy, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Verse two, enlarge the place of your tent. Hold on, why am I enlarging the place of my tent? I'm barren. Do it anyway. Build the baby crib. Start the business. I don't got any money. File the paperwork. Do something, break off the passivity, break off the lethargy, break off the hopelessness. I was on a plane once and I remember watching these documentaries of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and all these guys and I was weeping on the plane watching their stories because they refused to give up and none of them even knows Jesus. Lawsuits and bankruptcies and, and all these things that have come against them. And I'm like, what was inside of them that refused to give up? What if the church had even just a little of that? The place of contending prayer where we do not give up and we walk with joy in seasons of difficulty and expectation. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes for you'll spread out to the right and the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in desolate cities. I wanna 
give this amazing praise report today. It's just such a, a, an incredible moment for us. But about 10 years ago, I was walking in a village in India. And uh, I have this connection with India. I'm, my, my birthday is Indian Independence Day. And um, I've been there probably 30 times or more. And I, I've, I've had just such radical encounters. We've built the largest prayer and worship movement across the nation of India. And by the way, India... Uh, is going to be the largest nation in the world very soon. And they also are gonna have the largest church in ever in recorded history. So it's incredible what God's doing there. I hope you like curry. Um, so anyway, long story short, so I'm walking through this village. And it's my last day in India. I'm walking through this village that my friend wanted to bring me to. He's like, I wanna show you this village. So we're walking through it and it's, it's a village full of temple prostitution. So there's an entire cast of children that are born into be temple prostitutes. Their life is dedicated to be sexually molested every day by Hindu high priests. And we're walking through this and we're seeing this. And I remember, this, I'm about to go home the next day. And I remember I was so crushed. I was so, and I'm just looking at them. Aren't they doing anything? No, they're too powerful. The government can't do anything. Nobody can do anything. This is the way it's been for hundreds of years. And I'm like, well, what ministries are here? No ministries are here. They're too resistant. They kick everyone out. I'm like, well, is anybody doing anything? We went back to the hotel that night and I was just pacing and we were, we were, we were praying. I'm like, God, something's got to happen. And the Lord's like, you do something. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't have an infrastructure. I don't have the ability. I don't, I don't know enough people. I don't have government connections. I don't even know what to do. And so a month later, we launched this initiative and we rescued 13 of these children. 13. And then another village heard that we had done that. And then we went to that village and we rescued 20 more. And then another village heard. And these are places that are so far out there and so remote and so unreached. There's no ministries. There's, there's no connections out there. They're way out there. And so then we went to another. Pretty soon we found ourselves in over 70 villages. And yesterday we just surpassed 1,200 children saved. 1,200 children. 1,200 Come on. Isn't God good? And this is not like a typical compassion feeding program. These are saved out of the clutches of the darkest places in the nation. We're feeding them, we're clothing them, we're discipling them, we're educating them, we're giving them medical care, but most importantly, we're giving them the Holy Spirit. One of the first things that we do, and I, I just get so choked up. I mean, out of all the things that we do around the world, this may be the thing that's been the most powerful. We bring the kids in as we rescue them from human trafficking and child exploitation and the train tracks and temple prostitution. We bring them all in. One of the first things we do is we have a ceremony. And we get these like Burger King crowns. You guys remember that Burger King crowns? Like 90s kids here with me? Let's go, Burger King crowns. You know, and you gotta have it fit your head and it's gold and it's, it was fire. Those were greatest marketing thing they ever did. Anyway, we pass out these Burger King crowns and one by one we put them on the heads of these kids. We say, however you got here, Whatever happened to you in the past, today you're a king and you're a queen of the Most High God. Today you're restored, you're healed. And we, we, of course, we walk them through trauma therapy. We walk, I mean, and the guy that leads our program on the ground in India was rescued. I mean, he leads the whole thing. And I'm believing that these children, I just took my family there earlier this year. These children are gonna be the next leaders in the nation of India. The next teachers and lawyers and doctors and billionaires and prime ministers. But I share that with you because that all started as a prayer. God, I don't know what to do. 
And I could have very easily, I, I, part of me felt like this is too big of an issue. I'm just gonna get on the plane and I'll pray for them. And I felt like the Lord's like, no, 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 this, th th this is more. This is a moment of activation. Like you cannot leave this month of prayer, mercy culture, and be the same. Prayer causes you to act. Prayer causes things to change. Prayer causes you to do family and life and business differently. I'm gonna get the band up here. We're gonna, we're gonna do something to activate this. Reese Howells, I wanna read this. Man, I just think, I think about the people groups and the industries and the mandates that are dormant in this room. Like what if, and I mean, what if we would have never just said, like we had all the reasons to say we're in over our head, we can't do anything. Single barren woman. Single barren woman. Don't partner with discouragement. Don't partner with how big the enemy, partner with how big your God is. There's a famous story in World War II. The Nazis had, had taken over Europe and, and they were advancing. They crushed France and they were headed towards Britain. And I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Churchill. <laughs> he was such a gangster. Everybody, here's the thing. Everybody wanted to make peace with Hitler except for him. See, real leaders rise up in seasons like this. They refuse to compromise on the word of the Lord. Real leaders like David, they don't partner with the narrative of the nation to just, let's just keep Goliath in this corner. We don't want to be controversial. We don't want to make waves. David shows up and he goes, what the heck are y'all doing? Wake up, right? David said, giants are meant to fall. This is what prayer does in you. It makes you crazy. <laughs> Y'all are heading into a crazy season. All right, so Reese Howes. So, okay, so the Nazis are advancing. They're headed towards Britain. They're outmanned. The RAF is, is outmanned. The Royal Air Force in, in Britain is outmanned four to one. It's hopeless. They're going to crush Britain. And then they're going to come over to America and then we're all going to be speaking German. I mean, y'all got to see the significance of this moment. So Reese Howells is an intercessor and he gets this mandate from heaven. Maintain air supremacy. This is his mandate. Maintain air supremacy. If you win in the air, you're going to win on the ground. And so what does he do? He begins to stir up intercessors. They start praying through the night. They go down to the living room. They turn on the dial of the radio to hear what's happening with the war. They hear a report. They turn off the radio. They go back up and pray some more. And they get in this rhythm where they're praying and they're worshiping. And he, this is out of Reese House. This is what Reese House said. On the day of the declaration of war, he publicized the following statement. The Lord has made known to us that he is going to destroy Hitler and the Nazi regime, which is the Antichrist. I mean, he was a gangster. I mean, these are the leaders we need today. Call it out. The agenda of perversion against our children is the Antichrist. It's not a cute little thing in Target. No, no, this is an agenda to pervert and destroy our families. Call it what it is. Anyway, so he says, which is the Antichrist and release Germany, the land of reformation. The declaration sent them more determined than ever to their knees. They were now called to give their lives over to fight the battles of the kingdom as really as if called to fight on the Western front. God gave them responsibility from which they could never come free until the enemy that God was dealing with should be destroyed. 
We may, he wrote, have many a setback before he does. It may be that we, like the Israelites, will have to cry out to God in our extremity for the help which he will certainly come. On July 16, 1940, Hitler ordered the preparation of Operation Sea Lion as a potential amphibious and airborne assault on Britain to take over the nation. They had air superiority over the English Channel. In September, an RAF bomber command night raids disrupted the preparation of converted barges. And the Germans' failure to overwhelm, overwhelm the RAF forced Hitler to postpone and eventually cancel Operation Sea Line. Okay, so Operation Sea Line was Hitler's orders to destroy Britain. Something happened and it ruined his plans. Y'all gotta follow this, this is a big deal. Royal, Royal Air Force pilots were outnumbered four to one at the beginning of the Battle of Britain. On all accounts, it should have been a losing battle. However, when the Nazi advance was mysteriously turned away, this is, this is a secular history book. When the Nazi advance was mysteriously turned away right when all hope seemed lost, Winston Churchill famously said, Never has so much been owed by so many to so few. The words, these words are for all of those in contending prayer for spiritual air supremacy, standing in victory. So these intercessors, this is still a phenomenon to historians today. How did they, were they so outnumbered and they're so outgunned and how all of a sudden a mysterious weather pattern <laughs> changed the course of human history? I'll tell you how, because there's a group of intercessors contending in the place of prayer day and night until God broke through. This is who we're called to be. So this is what I want to do today. Come on, I want you guys to stand up. We're going to do something. There are people here that have partnered. I wear this shirt every time I come to this area. This is the one-way shirt. You know where this is famous from? 1967. Life Magazine, Dallas, Fort Worth, or Dallas, Dallas, Texas, in the Cotton Bowl. There's a picture of a guy standing on another guy's shoulders with this shirt on, and this was the motto of the Jesus People Movement that started in California, hey, and made its way over, and in the Cotton Bowl, of Dallas, Texas is when it was cemented into the minds of culture that God was moving in America. Up until then, it was kind of a fringy hippie thing. It showed up at the Cotton Bowl and this dude wore this one-way shirt and this was what was emblazoned on the minds of Americans across our nation. Why do I say that? Because this region right here, again, I go back to the Rangers game that I was at, which was really kind of a Dodgers home crowd, which really means that all of California's moved here, which really means that a lot of New York has moved here, which really means that God is setting you guys up for something significant. God is setting you up. I know traffic's bad. They're building more highways. Home prices are doing whatever. But you're here for such a time as this to wear the t-shirt and say, God is on the move again. One way. But there's people here today that you've partnered with your own barrenness in whatever area of your life. If you're here and you've partnered with that, I want you to come down here. We're gonna release some. Come on, don't, come quick. This, pretend this is a lettuce worship where they run to the altar and almost get injured. Okay, if you've partnered with the barrenness, and some of you guys, I'm just gonna say this, some of y'all just need new friends. Like, you gotta get rid of the negative Nancys. You gotta get rid of the pessimism. 
You got to get rid of the cynicism. You got to get out of your circle of all the Debbie Downers. Sorry if your name's Debbie or Nancy, but get out of that atmosphere. It says, sing, O barren woman. You feel barren. It feels difficult. It feels hard. Good. Sing and watch what God will do. Every state capital I mentioned to you, they're tough cities. Nobody has hope. I mean, I couldn't believe Austin. I was actually shocked. It was like, how many Texans don't have hope in Austin? I'm like, y'all gotta take responsibility for your capital city, man. Like this needs to be a place that legislates the righteousness of God. But every city we go to, we prophesy. We do Isaiah 54. We sing against all odds. We were just in Vermont. It's the least church state in America. Nobody has hope for it. And yet we were there a few days ago singing this. And I can hear those liberty bells rattling, rattling the gates of hell. <laughs> we were singing it in New York. I can hear those liberty bells ringing, ringing. We were prophesying. We were singing it out. I can hear. I can hear those liberty bells rattling gates of hell Oh, and I can hear those liberty bells ringing ringing Come on, I want you guys, come on, prophesy with me. Come on, sing it out. I can hear. I can hear. I can hear those liberty bells rattling, rattling the gates of hell
sound heavy, but it's not. I feel like there are people in here. I had this moment where God brought me back just a minute ago to when I lost my congressional race. And I felt like I had been tricked. I had given everything to this. I didn't even wanna do it. I didn't even care about politics. I didn't give a rip. I was just trying to follow God. And I lost and it was pathetic and everybody saw it and it was embarrassing. And I saw the eyes of the Lord. I didn't know it at the time. Looking at me smiling, thinking you have no idea what's to come. This is all part of my plan. Two weeks after I lost, COVID hits. If I didn't walk through looking behind the veil of government, I wouldn't have responded in the way I would have responded. Okay, so here's my point. There are people here today, you're coming out of a season where you feel embarrassed and you feel like you failed. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand. I want you to be honest. You feel like you miss God. I remember sitting at home. I remember just thinking, God, why did you do this to me? Like I sacrificed everything. I just weeping in my room, like felt like I felt so embarrassed and ashamed. I felt like I had missed God. And I wanna tell you today, you have not missed God. God has factored in. He's factored in every moment of your life. And this is a season today where he's gonna bring a divine resurrection to dreams and callings over your life. I break off the shame off of you. I break off the embarrassment off of you. I break off the hardship off of you. I break off the discouragement and I say, sing, 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 oh barren woman. Sing, oh barren woman. Sing, oh barren woman. Sing, oh barren woman. Sing, 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 sing. children on the other side of your pain. There's 1,200 children that are waiting for you to believe. Live up to your name. Live up to your name. Live up to your calling. Live up to your mandate. The whole world depends on it. The whole world.
world depends on it. We don't have time to mess with self-pity. We don't have time to partner with compromise. We don't have time to partner with addiction. Live up to your name. Church, live up to your name. Live up to your calling. Live up to your identity. Live up to what God has called you to be. Y'all, y'all are gonna, don't worry, you're gonna be able to go to the buffet, it'll still be open, but I, I, I just, I, I feel like, I feel like there's some people here, like you're just so good at like doing the church thing, because you're awesome, like you really are. I, I love coming here because people are so nice. It's like, I remember we were just battling on the West Coast and the East Coast, and finally we came to Texas and the <laughs> the Fort Worth police came up. They're like, how can we help you? And I'm like, wow. <laughs> can I just stay here? You know, I, I, I love that. Like so many people here, like you're just so good and you're, you're, you're amazing. And you come to the prayer meetings and you come to the, the programs and you do the church and you're so faithful. But I feel like today God is saying, you're not, you haven't stepped into the mandate. Like there's more that I'm calling you to do. Like it's not just a carbon copy church person. Like I've actually called you to live up to your name. I fashioned you with a unique DNA and a unique calling that's irrevocable. And part of this season of prayer, guys, is deepening our authority in God. It's deepening our intimacy. It's saying, God, I only want to do what I see you doing. I only want to say what I see you saying. I only want to go where I see you going. You know what that looks like? Controversy, especially in 2023. You're going to follow Jesus. You're controversial. Welcome. You believe there's only one way to the Father? You're controversial. You're a hater. You believe that marriage is between a man and a woman? You're a bigot. You believe children shouldn't be indoctrinated? Well, you're crazy. There is a calling that God has on some of you in this room. I can see it. God is showing me nations and people groups. Break out of your comfortability. Step into a season of obedience. Don't just pray the prayers and think that's enough. Live the prayers. I just want, I want you to extend your hand if, if you're just like, I want to step into a whole new season of obedience. I'm telling you, don't pray this prayer if you're not for real. I want to step into a season of obedience. Listen, <laughs> Reinhard Bonnke famously said, God, why did you choose me? God said, I, actually, I didn't. You were number nine on my list. You know how many mantles are hanging over a generation just waiting for somebody to grab onto them? I'm not the best worship leader. I'm not the best mobilizer. I'm not the best... I'm like way down on the list, but for some reason, we had the largest church service in the whole year of 2020 on planet Earth. Why? Because we simply said yes. Pray this prayer after me. This is dangerous. Say, God, today, I submit to your leadership. God, today, 
I want to go where you say go. I want to do what you say do. I want to live up to my name. I want to live up to my name. Give me courage. Give me boldness. Give me strength. Give me open doors. And give me the fear of the Lord. Come on, let's just sing this out one more time together. I can hear. I can hear. Let's prophesy. I can hear. 